Richard Haig. Is, is Dick back there, Ron? Richard Haig. He's here somewhere. Country Badassery. <laughs> and Amy Green. I just saw Richard, so I'll find him, and I will turn it over to them while they explore this literary, this kind of new literary term, but a really old, <laughs> across-the-board term, right? So I'll turn it over. Um, I don't know. He's, we're going to find him. Who's moderating this one? Marianne, are you moderating this? Okay. I was just making sure it wasn't Richard. So. You can talk among. You can talk among yourselves while we wait for Dick Hague. Just go ahead. Well, just go ahead. Um, so welcome, and uh, also uh, just a little personal thing. I want to say hi to Julie Watts' parents, Rayford and June, who are in the audience, <laughs> and and who've been my friends in Williamsburg, Kentucky, for 25 years. I've known Julie since she was little bitty. Um, so um, Silas asked us to uh, try to talk about this term, country badassery. I'm, hey, Dick. I'm not even sure that it is a literary term. Um, and I've grappled mightily with how to deal with that and what to say about that. Um, and I've laid awake at night thinking about this moment here on stage. And, you know, yeah, I, I really have. Um, so finally, Silas said that what we should do is maybe talk about that term in in terms of our own work as writers. So that's what I intend to do. I'm not sure what Ron and Amy and, and Dick are gonna do, but um, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So the first thing I think that I, I grappled with is how do you define what a badass is? Um, I mean, you can't define it very negatively. You can talk about someone who uh, is lawless or an outlaw or uh, defiant or someone who who uh, is a badass for hurtful and no good reason but but then there's also the notion of someone who might be like an action hero um, the example that kept coming back to me would be my film uh, action hero, my personal action hero, and that's Lieutenant Ellen Ripley from the Alien movies. I, I mean, I think she's a badass, you know. Yeah. So, so then Sala suggested, well, I could talk about my own mother because I've written about her so much and how she defied many of the gender expectations that were laid upon her in, in the mid-century America um, as, a, as a woman who... Um, who didn't work until I was a senior in high school, but she was a real, my mother was a real badass. She really was, and not in the bad sense, especially after she developed a chronic illness in her late life and lived the last four and a half years of her life in the nursing home. She was a real badass in the nursing home. <laughs> I'd go to see her and she wouldn't be in her room and I'd go to the nurse's station, where's, where's Haroldine? Oh, she's, off bossing the job somewhere, you know, and she'd be in the director's office giving him, you know, what for. And I have written a lot about my mother's roles, uh, domestic roles um, in my own work, but I wanted to talk for just a minute first about, um, and then I'm gonna shut up and y'all can do what you wanna do. I wanted to talk for just a minute about one of the women that I've written a little bit about in this series of poems I've been writing about um, country music, uh, women in country music, and I know if you were here yesterday, you're gonna think, she don't know anything except a little bitty bit about country music, but I'm gonna run that risk of talking about that. And that is a woman named Cynthia May Carver who went by the stage name of Cousin Emmy. And um, to me, she's the ultimate badass. And the reason is she took control of her career. She didn't let anyone else interfere. 
She um, had this wildly successful career as a radio um, celebrity all through the 1930s, built this huge audience, and never made any records until 1947. She did not make any, re she never recorded any music. Um, and there's this funny story that uh, Mike Seeger, I think it's Mike Seeger who tells this story. Cousin Emmy hired her family to be in her band and to, you know, to drive her Cadillac show car. She did have a Cadillac show car. And um, she took care of her family. And they had played a gig in Whitesburg, Kentucky. And after the gig was over, they were loading up, and there were some men who came around to the back and were going to fight. For whatever reason, they started to fight with the band. So Cousin Emmy comes out, and she says, what's going on? And, and you know, these local men are going to try to fight us. And she says to her bass player, can you fight? And he says, no, I'm studying to be a minister. And she says, here, hold my pocketbook. <laughs> And, and evidently, she picked up a microphone stand and began to, you know, wield it uh, among this, these men, and the crowd dispersed. But um, to me, that was a, you know. So I guess as a writer, my inspiration for badassery comes from the more positive uh, connotations rather than the negative connotations, although there certainly is a place for that, too, in, in literature. Um, so, I'll read this little poem that I wrote about Cousin Emmy, and then um, I'll turn it over to Dick and Amy and Ron. This is a poem that I, um, I'm imagining the voice of Cousin Emmy, and a, a, wait a minute. <laughs> I can't get my papers undone. No, it's hard when we're sitting like this. Sorry. Um, it's in her imagined voice, and it really has more to do maybe with my, my brother-in-law who does what happens in this poem, so it's, I was kind of inspired by him too. Um, but it's called Cousin Emmy and Her Kinfolk, Show Car. My brother-in-law always drove the show car, knew how to navigate every pig track and back road without a map could drive safe in cities too, drop us at the loadout on time without a hitch. Cheerful he was, and good-hearted, a big grin to match his wit. But Lord, he had enough of South Knoxville still in him to park that show car at a tilt under Mam's old shed, prop the door open, and let his hunting dogs flop in the back like a doghouse. So, if you were to come up on that, see that Cadillac full of old yellow dogs, you'd think we were right trashy. He kept the car shined up for us and always tried to clean the seats, but we were forever brushing dog hair from each other's hind ends before a gig. Blonde swirls and hanks we picked like strings, strummed off quick as a drop thumb on the banjo. So, so all the people on stage with me, I consider a badass in one way or another. Well, I do. Um, Dick Haig from Cincinnati and Amy Green from my daddy's home place in Russellville, Tennessee, and Ron Houchin from the hard streets of Huntington, West Virginia. <laughs> which, which one of you all wants to talk next? Yeah. Is that working? <clears throat> Thanks, Marianne. That's beautiful. Um, try this then. Badassery is an adjective or a noun, is a, is a term of admiration applied by others to a person for his or her power to amaze or stupefy by strength of character in the face of danger. That may easily include the challenge of being true to one's own values in the face of what one is expected to do by virtue of gender or position. Um, in a sense, if, if I qualify as a badass, which I don't, I think of myself as bad and frequently as an ass. But, but <laughs> the, the two together don't quite gel for me. 
Uh, as, <clears throat> and I'm reluctant to say this because um, once you say something like this, um, you are suddenly categorized, as, as Jason uh, Howard was mentioning uh, just the last session, but of as one of 12 atheists in Huntington, West Virginia, I'm immediately shoved into a position of diversity, in a sense, I suppose, but also bad while being a living ass um, about it. <clears throat> but, um, and also, of course, any work I do suddenly takes on that um, um, stigma. Badassery is defined in the Urban Dictionary as engaging in seemingly impossible activities and achieving success in a manner that renders all onlookers completely awestruck. The Oxford Dictionary says, badassery, characteristics or actions regarded as formidably impressive. Nowadays, it seems to have evolved to mean someone who thinks he or she is tough, an ass kicker. Among writers, that often devolves to trying to prove oneself gritty or dark. Um, the whole thing about badassery is that you can't declare yourself a badass. That's one of those powers others have over you and your work. Right? In um, an example, I would say, in, in, from my way of thinking, the early uh, civil rights workers, definitely badasses. Uh, the suffragists, definitely badasses. The early gay rights activists, definitely badasses. I can't imagine what these three groups of people went through or what they had to do to do what they felt like they had to do. Um, in literature, it's often someone who goes his or her own way, not waiting on approval and keeps on producing. And producing seems to be the key to badassery too. Um, not just an attitude, but you, something is done, something is achieved, something is made, um, I'm, and I'm guessing, right? I can't help but think, and I wish I could remember the name. I asked around, and I couldn't find anybody who remembered the name. In um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the Woman in the Flood, Jane. Jane. That's Jane? It's Jane? Okay, I should have just gotten the book out and gone back through it. And in uh, Robert Morgan's uh, Hinterland, the, uh, and check me if I got this wrong, it's been. Uh, the book was new when I read it. Uh, there's a woman who's about to give birth. She's in a cabin. Her man has gone off hunting. There's a mountain lion coming through this roof, tearing the shingles off. And, oh, excuse me? Pedal. That's right. And she doesn't she have to reach into the fireplace and grab a, a flaming ember to. That's. Yeah. Unbelievably. So I think badasses can be really likable, or they can go in the other direction. The all-time badass, in a way, is for me, has to be Captain Ahab in Moby Dick. I mean, not likable, but my God, he was he was he put a pusher, as it were. Um, and I think in the in the modern sense, a lot of the darkness and grittiness is mistaken for badassery. Um, I don't see myself as dark. I see myself as well. You know those nights. Where you could go, there's dark nights where there was no moon. You could go out. You could sit. If you're in the city, even you could climb up on a roof and you could look up and you could see the dark night. And after a minute or two, you'd see a few stars. A few more minutes, you'd see even more stars. Pretty soon, there were, especially if you're in the country, there would be hundreds of stars that you hadn't even seen before. <coughs> I think if you look beneath the surface, the light pushes through. And uh, I would like to read this, this short poem that I think could superficially be seen as dark, but I, th I think there's light in it. It's called Deer Carcass in Snow, and it bears an epigraph from the Confessions of St. Augustine. For what pleasure hath it to see in a mangled carcass? It's a season without verbs out here, a place of no action, like a negative of a photograph. It's positive, a summer green dough dwindling to bone and rag, the blankness of snows almost a gag, a morgue diminishing death beneath the bedsheet shrouding for final release in humus and decay. Half the people I know would look away, not glance back on this evening path. The other half would linger, gaping at dark patches in white cover. I'm no better than any other, 
stopping, staring, brushing off loose snow down to dark tissue and sparkles of snow like stars in a patch of night sky. Um, I think we... <laughs> Next. <laughs> you, want me to, you want me to go next? Okay. You know, you mentioned fighting as part of maybe what it means to be a badass. And what occurs to me is what does it mean to fight? You know, is it a physical, is it a physical thing? I probably wouldn't do very well in a physical altercation. But um, in my second novel, Long Man, I have this character who is being run off her land and she refuses to go and she's a holdout. And, you know, I think that's a kind of fighting. But there's, I, if you've noticed, like all the Disney princesses now kick ass, like literally. You know, all the, that's what they, they all know kung fu or they, they have some way of, you know, physically kicking ass. And, you know, and, and I think that's kind of come to be considered defying gender expectations. But for me, I think it's that fighting is, there's a vulnerability in it. So when I'm creating characters in fiction, I want them to be human more than anything. And to me, that's, that's badassery of, of a sort, of, of the highest order. Um, and you know, there was an anthology um, I think it was called Grit Lit, um, and Tom Franklin is an author that I love, um, and, and I was on a panel with him, I think, in South Carolina, and he talked about how there were very few women in the anthology, not, because, not for lack of trying, you know, he asked women to, um, to be involved, and I, I couldn't stop thinking about that after that panel. I thought, you know, why are more, and maybe they are, maybe we're just not aware of it. Why are more women not writing this sort of gritty, complicated literature? And I, I want suggestions, I want reading suggestions. I think of Dorothy Allison and there are people who come to mind. But I talked about this with one of my friends and she said that she thinks that maybe as Southern women and Southern Appalachian women were kind of taught to sweep the grit out the door <laughs> or like under the rug. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's really tough and strong to, to, stand, to stand up and, and talk about the dirty underbelly a little bit. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, a form of badassery. What do you think? Um, yeah, I was like Marianne laying awake, uh, who in the hell is a badass, you know, <laughs> in literature and in life? And, um, <clears throat> and, and there's all kinds of complications for me because I grew up in a town the whole town uh, must have thought of itself as badasses. Uh, and before the EPA was formed in the early 70s, there was a six city study done all over the country by Harvard and other uh, Eastern universities of air quality. And basically what they found out was that my town had the worst air in the United States. About two weeks after those results were announced, the local boutique came out with an ash gray t-shirt with black letters on it. We're number one. <laughs> the whole town was badass. It just thought of itself as badass. <clears throat> and, and in Steubenville, there, you know, there's many ways of thinking about badassery in, the, in this positive way of somebody who's just spectacularly proficient at something, but also guys like Paul Pyle who was famous because he, ha he was having a feud with somebody. He, the guy drove by him on Lincoln Avenue in downtown Steubenville. They both jam on their brakes and they have a fist fight in the middle of the street. It stops traffic for 10 minutes. Nobody intervenes, they just watch him fight and the fight's over and then the guys drive off. Badasses. <laughs> but, and then I started to say, who is who's a woman badass? And you know, I think maybe uh, Maggie Boylan and Mike Henson's stories has some qualities of the badass to her. Yep. Uh, but, but, you know, here's, I think Annie Dillard is one of the great Appalachian badasses. I mean, talk about facing it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tremendous spiritual adventure and so really more dangerous than a physical fight yes. that she's involved in in Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Uh, and she confronts it all. 
uh, in, in a magnificently dangerous way. I remember uh, after she had uh, con converted to Catholicism, uh, she said, and, and she's only half joking, they have no idea what powers they're messing with in a mass. And she called it the dread hootenanny. She was very much aware of the dread hootenanny, very much aware of uh, tremendous force in the universe, spiritual force and physical force, and, and I mean, just really put her face down in it. And, and to me, that book was a constant amazement in terms of a kind of badassery, if, if there could be a spiritual badassery. Yes. A spiritual strength. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read, have you read um, An American Childhood? Yeah. I love that part in there. I mean, a real badass lesson when she's playing football with the boys. Yeah. And she, said, she figured out that if she held back, she got hurt and screwed up the play. If she just went all out, she rarely got hurt, and things worked out better. Yeah. That's to me, that would be a really badass yeah. attitude. Of, uh, yeah. Well, in that same book, the guy who chases her after she throws a snow snowball and hits his car, this guy, this guy's a badass too. He chases her for like 15 minutes and doesn't give up. She thinks she's gonna ditch the guy, and he comes at you know. So she's she's confronted badass. Well, she's. Pittsburgh, come on, you know, the upper Ohio Valley. How can you get away from badassery of one kind or another? So we have urban badasses and we have country badasses all within two miles of one another. Oh, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But. The, your, your notion of Steubenville, the whole place being badass and the t-shirts, reminded me of what happened in Knoxville, my hometown in 1982 when um, I think it was the it might have been the Washington Post reporter who said, well, Knox was going to host this World's Fair in 1982 at this scruffy little city and called it a scruffy little city. And then everyone took that as, you know, a point of pride, you know, scruffy <laughs> little city. Exactly. Now there's even like a concert hall called the scruffy city room or something like that. Um, <laughs> You know, it becomes a point, it does become a point of pride. Mm -hmm. Besides Andy Dillard, who might be some other um, authors, maybe some other um, Appalachian writers that either you think of as badasses or <coughs> develop badass characters or defy oh, gender yes. expectations. Yeah. That's the other thing I struggled with in this panel is I gender think act. those are maybe two different topics yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that gender yeah. expectations or gen traditional gender roles is, is a separate notion than the notion of badassery, but I may be wrong about that. So authors, or maybe you might want well, to speak I, I, about I, I'm, I'm with Ron. I, th I thought that Ahab was probably the ultimate negative badass in American literature. But, you know, Godie Spurlock in uh, James Still's A Ride on the Short Dog, hit and batter and bash was Godie's thing. You know, it, it, it's, it's a painful, horrible story uh, with a very ambiguous ending, uh, but this is, this is the bully version of the badass, and, and I've always been, no pun intended, struck by him. Yeah. I think of Dorothy Allison, I think I mentioned her earlier, but yeah. Dorothy, Bastard out of Car Carolina and, and the character of Bone. I think Dorothy Allison is a badass and her character, uh, Bone, is a badass because she survives. You know, she's, she's a survivor, and that sometimes I think that's all it takes in the face of an onslaught of, you know, negativity and bad experiences just to come out of it intact and whole and, and with your spirit intact and held onto, and that spiritual badassery you're talking about. I mean, you know, to be vulnerable and completely human and, you know, just put one foot in front of the other so, I mean, that's probably the ultimate example in literature that I can think of. But I want more. I want, you know, because I feel like, I feel like I've wa I walked away from the other panel thinking, you know, where are the women, you know, where are the female writers who are telling the truth this way, and, and are, we being, are we being suppressed a little bit, you know, from it, or, or being discouraged from telling that kind of truth, so. I don't know, and is that a gender expectation? I don't know. <laughs> is it? What do you think, Ron? Um, say that again, Marianne. What was that? What are their? 
Well, is, is it a gender expectation that women aren't um, Sweeping in, it under encouraged the to engage in writing um, um, more gritty uh, type of stories or that kind of thing? Uh, speaking as a complete outsider, um, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> I would say uh, yes, uh, I think so. <laughs> sure. Ron is not in touch with his animus or his anima. They haven't integrated. They haven't integrated yet as an outsider. What about authors or writers that you consider to besides um, Melville that you consider uh, important badasses uh, or their characters? The four hundredth anniversary of probably the world's greatest novel, uh, Don Quixote. I mean, he's loony as you know. As an owl in oil, but um, he's definitely a badass. He's got his own vision. He goes at it. Uh, Virginia Woolf, to me, is an ultimate badass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and bringing up the idea of gender and gender expectations, her dictum that uh, you should write woman manly or man womanly, depending on your gender, that, that to me, that says it all. You, know, you can't just be, uh, forgive me, Rudyard, but you can't just be all male. Rudyard Kipling, you know, type of character. I love some of his stuff, but, um, and my mother was a woman. That makes me half woman. Any way you slice it, I'm a half woman. <clears throat> and, and, and I have two daughters, so I have to think oh. in, those, in those terms, you know. So, you know, <laughs> the male part of me is in total minority here. And um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's about as close as I can get right at the moment. I thought of another author. That, um, Toni Morrison is a total badass, I think. Mm -hmm. Beloved is, uh, to me, it's one of the best books ever written, but the character of Seth, I think, kind of you know, embodies that spiritual strength, even though she's, making, she's entirely flawed and imperfect, and she's making questionable decisions, but she, you know, she's a survivor in that way. So I wanted to bring, what about you? Um, um, as far as complications, I mean, one of the one of the best novels in, in world literature, I think, that deals with uh, unresolved gender issues and unresolved psychological uh, uh, unification is the French Lieutenant's Woman. Uh, there, there is so much going on in that novel about. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a woman who isn't connected to a male? What does it mean to be a male who is afraid of such a woman? I mean, it is a tremendously pot-boiling psychological study of unresolved gender issues, I think. And it happens in one of those transition modes, you know, at the end of the Victorian period, where, you know, all, everything is kind of up for grabs and the world is changing and, uh, I think it's a spectacular weaving of gender issues, even though I don't think it's ever presented as that. It's the French lieutenant's whore. Well, this, is, this is as far from that as could be. I, I wonder um, if you all remember when, sometimes there's controversy when a writer writes a, a novel or a story or a poem from the point of view of the opposite gender. Like, oh, you can't do that because, you know, you, you, you don't have those experiences. I remember Robert Morgan was criticized some when Gap Creek came out because he wrote it in the voice of Julie, the, the protagonist, and, you know, she has a baby in the middle of the kitchen floor, too, uh, in that novel. And there was some criticism about that. And, and, and I don't know whether that's past or whether that's, uh, you know, an issue. But it, that same sort of thing came, came to my mind again um, when I was reading Robert Guype's novel, um, Trampoline. And here is uh, a man writing in the voice of a 15-year-old girl uh, convincingly. And you know, I, I want to say about Dawn that she's my new Ripley. Dawn Jewell is my new Ripley, personally. I, I want to say what I heard Jack Higgs say one time about uh, Northrop, Northrop Fry, 
um, when he was teaching once, I, I want to take Don Jewell as my personal savior. <laughs> he, said, he said that about uh, the critic Northrop Fry. Um, but um, I don't know if that's an issue. I mean, do you all see that as an issue, that a man can't write a woman's point of view, a woman I, can't write a man's point of view? Definitely not. Wally Lamb's book, She's Come Undone, I mean, he... He did that flawlessly. He wrote this this completely believable female narrator. I, I think you can write anything. <laughs> you know, I think if, you, if you're coming at it um, w compelled to write, and that's your, your reason, and you don't have some other agenda, or, I mean, I think anybody can write anything and write it convincingly. Well, then, do you think the controversy arises from others who try to impose those gender expectations on the writer? I mean, does it come from the readers? Does it come from the audience? I don't know. Does it? What, what do you think? I don't know. I think it's, it's a, another complication of identity politics, and whoever's dealing the cards that day gets to win. Yeah. It's sort of like when you're <laughs> tagged as a regional writer or whatever your, you know, whatever label is being put on you. It, it yeah. comes from outside. It does, yeah, yeah. You know, it's the people who put the books on the shelf, you know, that are giving you the, that are giving you the, the labels. Yeah, I hope it's not true. I, I mean, I, I, I hope that in the future I might be able to write something that looks from a woman's point of view. I hope it's true, that, it, that it's possible, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I rest. We should ask Robert. If Robert has had any hassles about, you know, his female narrator. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, I imagine he's had some, gotten some bad response or flack about that, the idea of license. I just finished the seventh revision of a young adult horror novel, I'm trying my hand at that, and there's a female character in there named Audrey, who's a young, uh, part of Apache um, cousin of the main character, and all through working out through, uh, through the novel, I, f I just had this issue come to my mind what right do you have to say this about this girl? You know, and I had to keep telling me something like what Amy just said, and, and that, <coughs> excuse me, that women are a diverse group, you know, a very diverse group. So theoretically, there's a woman out there somewhere who's a hell of a lot like me. I, mean, I feel sorry for her, but that still, <laughs> she, she's, she's probably a hell of a lot like me in terms of in terms of psyche, in terms of mentality, and, and all that stuff, and, and emotional hang-ups, and all, all of it. And so I kept repeating that to myself, and, and, and that gave me license to, to flesh out this character and just keep, and keep going with her as much as I needed to do, even though I felt like I had no real right to do it. You know, I, I've written multiple male characters, and somehow it's never occurred to me that maybe I shouldn't be doing it. So maybe I'll reevaluate and really think about it the next time. But, you know, it's just, it's never, I think, I think for me, I'm always trying to just get at the humanity of the, of the character. So may, it doesn't occur to me, but I just, I just launch in, you know. And I never, I never wondered if I was doing it well or not. Maybe somebody can, can tell me if I've, you know, if I've mistakenly stood in a man's shoes in the wrong way. But, but um, I don't know. I think it's, it's just never occurred to me to not go where I wanted to go, you know, as a writer, and, or at least to try it, you know, stick my toe in, mm -hmm. in the waters, gender-wise especially. Mm -hmm. um, I've just never been hesitant to do it. Hmm. Well, my, my upbringing was so utterly, overwhelmingly masculine, macho, in a, in a steel town, in a male-dominated Irish Catholic family, uh, that, you know, the only sort of uh, meaningful, uh, really rich, deep presence womanly was my great-grandmother, who I think I must have romanticized into the Earth Mother and the Blessed Virgin, even though she had nine children and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but I, 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 I still consider myself a victim of, uh, of a male-dominated uh, culture. And, you know, I, maybe that's my reticence about entering into imagining the, the interior lives of women, you know, in a fictional or poetic way because I, I didn't have much training in it. Yeah, I was, I was brought up to be a racist and a fundamentalist Christian. 
and I don't know about, about a half a dozen other things that I, I could say is in a negative way. But one of the beautiful things for me is in the process of becoming an elderly person, now that I'm 68 years old, is that um, I don't give a damn. I, mean, I know, you know, I can see what's, what's coming. I can even feel it on certain days. And that's a, a terribly freeing thing that actually occurs at about the age of 40, I think. At least it did for me. And in, in a way, aging is a process of badassery or badassing or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I always pr prefer the term maturing to aging. <laughs> Who was it said yesterday, the older I get, the more I don't give a damn? Who said that? Was, was it oh. Pam Duncan? Yeah, it was Pam Duncan. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, you badass. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, well, we've got a few more minutes. We, we started a little early, so we can end a little early. Um, Ron said something uh, a few minutes ago about um, about getting permission to write from another point of view or you know where do I get permission to do that or you know who says what gives you the right to do that who does give us the right to do that I mean besides ourselves I mean are we are we so tied up with conventions and what people expect of us as writers that that we that we're hemmed in by um, gender roles gender expectations I don't know I think what gave me permission, in a way, if, if I can call it permission, was as a kind of a checklist. Do I have an ulterior motive? You know, am I writing lightweight pornography here? Am I, am I seeing this as a person, an object, or am I actually thinking of my own real-life half-Apache cousin that I was basing the character on? Huh. And as long as there was no malevolence in my mind, which is very rare, actually, uh, then I felt... <laughs> I felt okay. I felt okay with it. And, and I, pr I promised myself through the next 150 pages that the, the second she became as dark as the back of my mind felt at times, I was going to drop her. I was going to get out of there. I was going to give her an exit so that she wouldn't become tainted by my bullshit, if you know what. See, I think that's it. I think it's about examining your own heart, you know, because in the end, it's like you're saying, who are the arbiters, you know, who decides? And... I think we are, you know, we decide what, if we're capable and able, but I think we do have to, you really have to examine, like you said, where is this coming from? And as long as you've done that, there, I think you can give yourself permission to do it, you know, but I, you have to be thoughtful. You know, I think if you are going to, and if a man is going to write as a woman or, or vice versa, I, I think you do have to put some specific thought into it and what's my motive and, and things like that. But, you know, as far as who, you know, I don't think anybody, anybody outside of our skin can dictate what our heart is telling us to write or to do. So it's us, you know, we, we're the, we give ourselves permission. The writer's solitude isn't really much solitude sometimes, though. Yeah. There are a lot of voices. There sure are, yeah. 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 I, I think one of the things that gave Ron Houchin permission is uh, when he had his DNA done. Go ahead, Ron, tell us what, oh. what, <laughs> what it is. What are you? Uh, this, is, this is one of those great times to make a commercial for the National Geographic Society and their <laughs> genome project. I gave myself a Christmas gift a few years ago. I'd always heard this legend that there was Indian blood in our family, Native American blood in our family, because my grandmothers looked so much like an Indian. Um, and so I thought, well, that's enough of this crap. I'm going to find out. So I you know, paid the money, got the kit, did the little swab, sent off the DNA, and waited these tedious next eight weeks to find out that I was, and you can add this up, it doesn't, it goes way beyond 100%, but that I was 44% North, Northern European, 37% Mediterranean, 18% Middle Eastern, Middle Asia, Asia Minor, that is, and 2% Northeast Asian, which means Mongolian, that I had 4.9% Neanderthal blood. <laughs> Before your laugh, it's too late, you've already laughed. Everybody, everybody has 2 to 4%, right? I just happen to have a little more. 
plus the bonus that came along a few months later, they keep up with, they keep doing research and finding out more and sending you updates. I found out I had 2.6 Denis Denisovian blood, which is the Asian version of Neanderthal blood. So I got a shit ton of Neanderthal blood in me. <laughs> and, um, but what, what really came out of that was looking through all the pictures of the people of these different regions, uh, uh, you know, especially with all the stuff about terrorism in the news in the Middle East and all that now, was realizing them's my people, you know, that, that, and that everybody is my people. Pardon the grammar there. Um, because all of us, all of us badasses, that's everybody on the planet and those to come, came up out of Africa and went through that narrow little area and split left and split right. And um, so, you know, in, in my mind, in a way, the ultimate badasses would have to be those people who, who did all that. I mean, in each of us, there are how many billions of people behind the DNA sitting here in you, you know, right now. It's, it's, it's staggering. I tried to do the math once for my, well, I taught high school for 30 years, and I tried to do this math once for my students and ran out of blackboard space. You know, here's you, here's your parents, here's your grandparents, oh, yeah. you have your parents. Your parents. We just kept on doing that for like four days till we filled up the, filled up the blackboard. They loved it because it meant they had no homework, really. So <laughs> it, and it, it gets to be staggering. So I just left it on the blackboard for like three weeks you know, so they could see. And we just stopped because we ran out of blackboard space. So. Um, Amy, you read um, last panel, but did you bring something else to read? I read my book. Oh okay. my gosh, I feel like a bad Dick, what about you? Did, have you okay. had, did you bring something you could give okay. us a little benediction? Uh, just a little bit here. Um, uh, this is this is that male culture that I grew up in, and I hope this is a little more complicated than it seems at first. Um, it's 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 a poem really based about the culture, the high school culture in uh, you know a thriving industrial town dominated by gigantism, steel mills, big locomotives power of all kinds. It's called In Training, Steubenville, 1965. Overbuilt hills, though paved still too steep for houses, clabbered and bricks sliding down their lawns like the effects in cheap horror films. And behind us in his car, fat ex-marine, coach, a smoker, lucky hanging from his lower lip, stained fingers gripping his tore up Chevy's wheel. Listen, you assholes, if you can't run any faster, I'll get out and show you how. And us, wheezing in the soot and sulfur air, the sky over the mills as red as Mars, the breeze glinting with graphite and dust, us suddenly breaking stride, doubling over in pack, laughing, gone crazy with exhaustion, laughter, weakness, and more laughter, gone crazy over the picture in our heads of him, rolling out of his car like a sideshow freak, Porco, the human haystack, step up, Step right up, folks, see the incredible landslide of his flesh, a human tectonic event more weighty than California. All right, I'll show your pansy asses. And so, up on our feet again, heading out in every direction from him, as light again ourselves as noon, our feet silver and gliding up the hills, and him behind us, slag pile, gob heap, trying to run, and us speeding up, spending it all, shouting, come on coach, catch us, and then splitting up again, one guy down the alley behind school, the other up past the library, another slanting toward the mill, and now each of us carrying in our heads the picture of him suddenly stopping, clutching his chest, his face torn in agony, and the whole slab of him rocking, tottering, then falling, tractor-trailer load of bad meat pile up on the highway, smoke rising from the explosion. And we slow down then, stop, and feel inside us, underneath the burn of our lungs, beneath the fire and thigh and calves, power. The adults limping far behind us, power the world ahead all our own, its fires and mills and dollars and power, all ours, its homecoming queens and beauties, all ours. And then, just as suddenly, knowing we know nothing about any of it, 
nothing of women, beauty, money, work. We turn, jog, then almost in panic, sprint back to find him lying where we left him in our dust, gaping, eyes glazed, shirt torn open at the throat, beyond the helping of us now, beyond all revealing of even the slightest of secrets, beyond all urging and cursing of us, and even beyond all our forgiving, and yet one or two of us already gently on our knees beside him, holding up his awful sweating head as tenderly as sons would, and tears, God damn it, tears bitter as acid starting in our eyes. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll let that be the final word, Dick, and thank you for that. So uh, don't forget that uh, we will be glad to put our badass signatures on our badass books. <laughs> and y'all go out and be badasses. Thank y'all.